Well, good morning and a happy Easter to you and welcome to our 950 service. So thankful that you chose to join with us on this Resurrection Lord's Day. Two inmates were being prepared for their executions, and the warden of the prison where they were held was taking care of the final details. He asked the first inmate if he had any final requests, and he said, yes, I do. I would like all the Taylor Swift songs played for 24 hours before my execution. I know she has over 200 songs, and I want to hear them all. The warden said, well, I think that can be arranged. But then the prisoner added, I'd like all those songs played for those 24 hours to also be broadcast into every cell in the prison. The warden was a little bit unsure about that, but said he would inquire about it. The second inmate was then asked about his final request, and he said, if you grant the first guy his request, mine is you execute me first and make sure it's 24 hours ahead of his execution. (laughs) I just lost all the Taylor Swift fans out there. The subject of death and dying is certainly a solemn one, because if you've been around death very much, you know how the impact of a person's death can cause great grief. If you've lost somebody very close to you, a spouse, a a parent, a child, a sibling, you know the depth of the pain can be immense. In the loss of someone you love, there can be a lot of darkness. And that's really where I want to pick up the story of the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to be looking at John chapter 20, and we're going to be seeing a character on whom I want to focus, one of the women who witnessed Jesus' crucifixion, but would also later become a witness to His resurrection. This is a woman who had a journey of faith that took her from demons to ultimately the discovery of a new life in Jesus Christ. Now, your journey of faith may be new to you, or maybe you have been a longtime follower of the Lord, or maybe the only thing you know is that right now it's your first time in church in a long time, and maybe you're not even sure what to expect. But wherever you might be in your faith journey, it's my prayer you will listen and follow along as we observe how one woman's journey of faith moves from dilemma to one of discovery. We're continuing our sermon series entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. And today's message is life over death. It's not just about Jesus having victory over death. It's also about how one person was heading towards death and found her way back to life because of him. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open to John 20. You can also download our app, and there's a sermon note section there. Or you can follow the verses that will be on the screen behind me. But let's see how our journey of faith, uh, how this woman's journey of faith went from death to life, how darkness was ultimately overcome with the light of Christ, and hope was again seen. So we start in John 20, verse 1, with the dilemma. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Mary Magdalene had just experienced one of the bleakest days of her life because she had seen Jesus die on the cross. Mary was disillusioned. She had witnessed most of the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion. She had been present at the mock trial of Jesus. She had heard Pontius Pilate pronounce the death sentence on Jesus. She saw Jesus beaten and humiliated by the crowd. She was one of several women who stood near the cross to provide comfort to the Lord. It was bleak for Mary, and it was a dilemma she had not expected. Jesus had cast seven demons from her that had tortured her for years. You see, Mary uh, was not a bad person, but at one time she had been a mad person because demons had tortured her soul and she needed freedom. And Jesus freed her from those demons. Now, no one else could do for Mary what Jesus had done. No one loved her like Jesus had. And now he was dead. At age 33, she watched him get crucified. He was gone, and she was nauseous with grief. It was dark. It was a reminder of how she felt so near death when she had had demons inside of her while it was still dark. Mary was disillusioned with her life at the moment. Jesus had claimed to be the Messiah, and she believed he was going to liberate Israel. He could walk on water. He could raise the dead. He had even mobilized Roman soldiers. But when those same soldiers arrested Jesus, he just surrendered, and like any other mortal, he died. To Mary, Jesus was a compassionate friend, but his being the long-awaited Messiah, she was going to need, need to rethink that on this dark weekend. 
That verse we read in John 20 verse 1 mentions only Mary, but the other gospel accounts make it clear that she did not go to the tomb by herself on that morning. Uh, There was a woman named Salome, uh, Joanna, uh, Mary the mother of James, and they took spices to anoint Jesus' body. Now the Jewish people did not embalm bodies like we would do today. Instead, they wrapped the body in linen and spices to show respect. Uh, We already know in Scripture that a man named Nicodemus donated 75 pounds of spices to anoint the body of Jesus. I am guessing that the men started the job of preparing the body for burial, but the Sabbath was nearing and they didn't finish it completely. And so the ladies probably watched from a distance, but they weren't completely satisfied, so they go to the tomb to ensure the best possible preparation for the burial had been done. Now, I immediately see this highlights one of the differences of the two genders. The men started the job, but the ladies weren't completely satisfied with the outcome, and they wanted to get it done better. I can cook dinner, clean up the mess, wipe down the kitchen counters, clear off the table, put the dishes in the dishwasher, and leave the room. Ten minutes later, I come down the hallway back into the kitchen, and Barb is in the kitchen wiping down the counters, cleaning the table, rearranging the dishes in the dishwasher. Of the morning, we'll get up, and I will make the bed while she is in the shower, get the bed all made. She'll come out and go, you have the bed spread on sideways. You don't have it on the right way. The next morning, she comes back out. She goes, you did it again. It's almost like it's done on purpose. Women are often better than men, noticing certain details. These women were frustrated because Jesus died so near the Sabbath that they didn't have time to complete the process, and because of their love for Jesus, they wanted it done right. Now, Mark's gospel says, as the women trudged towards the tomb, they wondered who would roll away that huge stone at the entrance. They had seen the tomb sealed. It was a tomb that another friend of Jesus had provided. The person's name was Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, I saw a meme recently that had a conversation between Pontius Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph had requested the body of Jesus so he could bury it. Now, understand that most victims of crucifixion were not buried, but their bodies were left to rot on the cross. The meme had Pontius Pilate saying, Joseph, I really don't understand. You're one of the richest men of the region, and yet you've spent a small fortune on a new tomb for you and your family, and you want to give it to this man, Jesus? And I love Joseph's response. He goes, it's just for the weekend. (laughs) Mary was not only disillusioned in this dilemma, Mary was also determined. When she got to the tomb, the stone had already been removed. Now, notice she does not immediately enter the tomb, verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, the word for running is used here only a few times in Scripture, and it means one who is thrown into confusion but is seeking answers. Mary Magdalene was a high-spirited woman. She would rather run than wait. She'd rather ask questions than to wring her hands and wonder. And I think Mary ran back into Jerusalem. She found Peter and John. John refers to himself in his gospel as the other disciple, the one. Jesus loved, and Mary assumes the body has been stolen by someone. She simply says, they, whoever they is, have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now, we know from Matthew's gospel that the scene of what happened just a few minutes before the women arrived there, there was an earthquake that occurred, soldiers at the tomb had become disoriented, an angel came down from heaven and sat on the stone that was rolled away, the soldiers leave the area to go tell the chief priest what had happened, and then the women arrive on the scene. Now, remember, Mary had demons in her past, and often those with demons would hang around cemeteries. Uh, There was another person that Jesus had healed from demons that becomes known as the Gadarene demoniac, and he actually lived within the cemeteries. Did Mary hesitate because of her past even go near a tomb? Sometimes when you have dealt with a bad habit 
an addiction, a destructive relationship in your past, there are going to be moments when it comes up again. Jesus had removed Mary's demons. But if you're a Christian, Jesus has forgiven you, but there are those moments when the reality slap occurs and you have to readjust. I think going to the tomb made Mary a little bit nervous. I heard about a guy who had worked as a driver of a hearse for over 40 years, but he changed jobs and became a limo driver. On his first trip to pick up a client at the airport, the passenger he was picking up got into the back seat and he was on his cell phone, and a few minutes later, the passenger reaches up and taps the driver on the shoulder to give him directions, and suddenly the driver starts weaving all over the road. He got the vehicle stopped, and he looked back at the passenger and said, don't ever do that again. He said, I drove a hearse for 40 years, and I'm not used to anybody reaching from the back. (laughs) Jesus had seen Mary at her worst, seven demons inside of her, and Mary had seen Jesus at his worst, being crucified. And I think how Jesus handled the crucifixion caused Mary's faith to increase, but the fact that he was dead probably caused her faith to wane. And now the body's gone from the tomb. She couldn't bear much more. Maybe your life has some circumstances where your faith is waning right now. Tough marriage situation. Maybe a recurring and aggressive cancer. Maybe just horrible financial situation right now. Maybe a job that seems to be going south very quickly. Can you hold on? Can you wait to see how the Lord might possibly work? He may change your situation. He may give you more strength than you thought you had to get through it. And he may walk beside you. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Just like Energizer bunnies, Peter, John, and Mary run towards the tomb. Now, I love the fact that John couldn't resist, including in his own gospel, that he was a faster runner than Peter. Uh, That is the male ego coming out. John was younger, maybe he was in better shape, maybe he spent more time on his stairmaster, but John gets to the entrance of the tomb first, but he hesitates, and Peter blows right by John and enters the tomb. Now remember, Peter is always the one with the impetuous personality. And Mary? Well, in her determination, she made a grave mistake, no pun intended. By leaving the tomb early and going to get Peter and John, she missed some evidence that the body of Jesus was not stolen at all, but that indeed he had resurrected. The stone was moved, but who moved it? Not the soldiers. They were stationed there to make sure it wasn't moved. Not the disciples. They were hiding behind locked doors for fear of being arrested. Not the enemies of Jesus. They wanted the body to remain in the tomb. And if they did move the stone, they could produce the body later to prove that he was dead. The only logical conclusion is that God moved it. But this is where we begin to see not just the dilemma, but also the discovery, the confirmation that Jesus had risen from the grave. So I see two ways that life over death is discovered at the tomb of Jesus. First, there is physical evidence that Jesus had risen from the dead, and John is the one who discovered it. Verse 6, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, notice John mentions it again that he beat Peter, he also went inside. He saw and believed. Peter entered the tomb ahead of John, but John carefully investigates what is in front of him. It's no accident that John includes in his version of the story that the cloth and the linen had been wrapped in Jesus' body, that they are lying there in the tomb. And when John sees those grave clothes, he is convicted that Jesus had risen. I think what John saw were the grave clothes still wrapped as if containing a body but they were instead deflated. When Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried the body of Jesus, they brought the 75 pounds of spices. That means they would have wrapped the body with a layer of linen and then a layer of spices, and they'd keep repeating that process until the body was wrapped like a mummy. 
And when John and Peter saw, I think what they saw was like an empty cocoon. Later, Jesus would appear to his disciples twice in an upper room, once with Thomas absent and then the second time with Thomas present. And Jesus on either occasion did not enter the room through the door. He mysteriously came through the wall. So passing through grave clothes and leaving them as deflated would be no problem for Jesus. And when John saw those empty grave clothes, he knew he discovered that Jesus had risen from the dead just like he said he would. A preacher friend of mine went to a concert last Saturday night up in Cleveland. Uh, the concert was by Petra. Petra was a Christian band that was very popular during my growing up years in the 70s and 80s. And I saw my friend's social media posts, and it got me to thinking of hearing Petra on back then on old cassette tapes. And so I pulled up some Petra songs, and I listened to one entitled Grave Robber. And it's a reminder that because Jesus rose from the grave, we will too. And some of the words of that song are, there's a step that we all take alone, an appointment we have with the great unknown, like a vapor this life is just waiting to pass, like the flowers that fade like the withering grass, but life seems so long and death so complete and the grave an impossible potion to cheat. But there's one who has been there and still lives to tell. There's one who has been through both heaven and hell and the grave will come up empty handed that day. Jesus will come and steal us away. The body of Jesus wasn't stolen from the grave, but I'm okay if Jesus comes and steals my body from the grave. John saw physical evidence that made him believe. And then there's a personal encounter that Jesus had risen from the dead, and Mary is the one that discovers him here. This woman, who had been saved from demons and had seen her Lord die on the cross, was about to have an encounter she is never going to forget, and as we're going to see, that she never wanted to release. Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Mary is left alone at the tomb. Remember, while it was still dark. But she sees angels, and they ask why she's crying. But right then, Jesus appeared to her, but she didn't realize it was him. Uh, Liz Curtis Higgs, in her great book, Unveiling Mary Magdalene, said maybe Mary didn't recognize Jesus because she had too many tears in her eyes, or maybe there wasn't enough sunlight yet, or maybe Mary just didn't have enough faith yet, or maybe she was suffering from angelic overload. She had just seen a couple of angels. Maybe she was suffering from aerobic overload. She had just run from the tomb to Jerusalem and back to the tomb, or maybe because of the wardrobe change from what she had seen Jesus wear on the cross to what was, he was now wearing. Liz Curtis Higgs writes, I think Jesus himself held back his identity, giving Mary Magdalene time to absorb the truth. Jesus appearing after his resurrection and not being recognized is not that unusual. Maybe you remember that he appeared on a road uh, with two, on a road to Emmaus with two of his disciples, and they didn't even recognize Jesus until later that evening when they had dinner together, and he passed the bread to them, and they noticed the nail prints in his hands. In John 21, Jesus is cooking breakfast for his disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and there's this strange verse in John 21, 12 that says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Why would you even think about asking who it was if you knew who it was? It tells me there's something different about the resurrected body of Jesus. And I think that was Mary's issue. She saw a different body. You know, sometimes we might not easily recognize someone if we haven't seen them in a long time. Uh, my high school class had, had two reunions. Uh, we had a 10th reunion, and we also had a 25th reunion. Now, I couldn't make the 10th reunion, but I did make the 25th reunion, which was <clears throat> years ago. And I walked into my old high school gym, and when I walked into that gym, let me tell you, some of my classmates had changed so much, they didn't even recognize me. <laughs> I don't even recognize me. You don't go up to somebody at a high school reunion and go, Annette, is that really you? You don't do that. 
they're going to be offended by that. No, you watch and you listen and you see if another classmate maybe calls the name correctly. But it was just the opposite with Jesus, I think. Because, see, the last time Mary had seen him, he had just been crucified. His body was mangled. His body was torn. I think now he is standing before her in a new and a glorified body. She didn't immediately recognize him. Circumstances, the years can change our physical bodies. And Mary thought Jesus was the gardener. That would have been basically like the cemetery caretaker today. Isn't it interesting Jesus isn't mistaken as a soldier. He's not mistaken as a carpenter. He's not mistaken as a shepherd. He is mistaken as a gardener. The first Adam was put in charge of the Garden of Eden, and he sinned. He didn't take care of it, and he messed it up, and we have messed it up ever since. But the Bible comes along and calls Jesus the second Adam, who will ultimately be the gardener of eternity and straighten everything out. And so this morning, if you're dealing with some issues in life and circumstances and problems and things that have set you back and you just wonder, is there any hope? Can I remind you today that in eternity there's going to be a gardener who will make all things right? Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. In one word, Jesus revealed her identity and his own. He just said, Mary. She had heard that voice before. That same voice that had called seven demons out of her now spoke to her again. I think right then, the sunlight of the morning overcame the darkness of the night. I think right then, Mary's heart skipped a beat as she realized that life had just defeated death. And Mary grabs on to Jesus, and she doesn't let go. And it's as if she's just holding on to him and not wanting that moment to pass. And she's going, oh, Rabboni, oh, Rabboni, my sweet Jesus, my sweet Jesus. And I think we can understand that because she's just gone from the darkest, most hopeless night of her life that pointed only to death, now to the sunlight of a new morning and to hope that restores to life. What about your journey of faith? Mary Magdalene's faith was resilient in that she kept following Jesus when she could have easily bailed. There's just one lesson I want you to take home with you today, and it's this. Jesus can deliver you from a past and invite you into the future with him. Jesus can deliver you from a past and invite you into the future with him. As long as there is life, there is hope. And as long as there is Jesus, there is both life and hope. Mary knew what it was like to be spiritually dead. She knew what it was like to be in the clutches of the adversary. But now she knew what it was to be spiritually alive in Christ. And even though Mary Magdalene's name will always be linked to her past of being demon-filled, she knew now there was a future. Remember, hers was not a bad past. It was just a mad past. And Jesus removed all that madness from her life. Do you have a past that you wish had never happened? Now, let me be honest. You may always deal with some of the consequences of that past. But there is hope and there is life and there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And you can either choose to hang around the cemetery and teeter with entering back into the past. Or you can run from it and allow Jesus to run with you. After the Easter Sunday morning scene at the empty tomb of Jesus, Mary Magdalene is never mentioned again in Scripture. So she's Mary Magdalene or Mary of Magdala, a small town. And the small town of Magdala was known for its textile industry, its clothing industry. And so I think that Mary Magdalene went back probably to work in one of the textile factories, one of the clothing mills. And I think just every day as she went back to work, she probably shared the story of how Jesus brought her life over death. John Weiss, in his book, Me Too, Experience the God Who Understands, writes about when he was being bullied in the fourth grade. John Weiss writes, I used to pray that God would send Rocky Balboa to beat up the bully. God, forget the Russians, I would implore. I want Sylvester Stallone to get in the ring with Ashley Tucker. Yep, the bully's name was Ashley. I was getting beat up by a boy with a girl's name. John Weiss continues, but one day, Ashley got on the monkey bars and needed help. He was stuck halfway between and wasn't willing to let go. 
Another student named Scott, who was known to be very kind, walked over, and with everyone watching, thinking Scott was going to help Ashley, Scott instead reached up, grabbed Ashley's pants, and pulled them down, underwear and all. And Ashley was left exposed to a group that he once had bullied. Mary had been bullied by demons, and Jesus stepped in and became her help, and he exposed the demons, and he freed Mary, and the demons fled. And when Christ becomes your Savior, your past can melt away. Jesus invites all of us to walk from our past and to enter into a future with him, a future that promises life over death. And maybe this morning you need to make that decision. You need to make a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Here in just a few moments, the choir is going to come back on stage and lead us into a song to help prepare our hearts and our minds for communion for the Lord's Supper, and then we're going to have a closing worship song together. But before that happens, I want to remind you that if you need to become a follower of Christ, you can do that today. When we dismiss here in just a little bit, you can meet with me right up here near the baptistry area, up here by the cross. If you need to make a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, believing that he rose from the dead, believing that he has had eternal victory over the grave and he can give you the same, that you are willing to repent of your sins. The word repent is the word metanoia. Meta means change, like metamorphosis, noia mind, making a change of the mind to follow after Christ and then to be baptized into him. You can do that this very day. Maybe you've already done that and you'd like to bring your membership to our church family. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, we come to lift up the resurrected Christ. We celebrate today his rising up out of the grave and can't even begin to imagine what Mary must have experienced as she walked towards that tomb. Did her past haunt her again? Did she feel like maybe there was something else different that needed to occur? And yet eventually she saw the risen Lord and he spoke with her and she with him. And that beautiful word when he simply said, Mary. She had to have known then that her sins were forgiven. Her heart had been made pure and she had a future ahead of her. And so God remind us that living in Christ, we always have the hope of a future. Even when things in this world aren't going so well, we have a great hope because of the resurrection of Jesus and the promise to live eternally. In his name we pray, amen.